Walker saw his face has never made the cover of time. Most of us had never heard his name. But what he sells flows in the veins of most of America's junkies. He is the world's biggest drug dealer. And New Center 4's Gary Rebstock went to Burma to get his story. Gary? Sylvia, in one of the poorest valleys in Burma lives a man named Kun Sa, and he is a multi-millionaire. But like the beautiful red poppies that grow in his fields, Kun Sa is not what he appears. He is a father whose trade kills children, a monarch who cries freedom, a drug dealer who builds schools, a man who holds much of America captive. In my opinion, Kun Sa is obviously one of the most notorious drug traffickers in the history of the world. The general would be a hero to you? Yes, not only for me, for the Shan peoples. In the United States, uh, I would rank him as public enemy number one. I think he is uh, freedom fighters. Kun Sa and his group had uh, laid on an assassination attempt of our group, either an assassination or a kidnapping. <laughs> Who is this man with the haunting laugh who's accused of trying to kill a U.S. congressman? who's considered a hero by his people, who has his own private army, who travels his land in a white pickup truck with six armed guards in the back, and whom you've probably never heard of. And how did he come to be the world's biggest drug dealer? That's what we went to find out. <laughs> Kun Sa lives in what is called the black area of Burma, the Shan state, called black because it is not controlled by the Burmese government. It lies south of China and west of Laos and Thailand. To reach Kun Sa's Homong compound, you enter the Shan state illegally from Thailand. From the border, it is a 12-hour trip by mule and on foot through dense jungles and thick forests. The Shan state is a mountainous region. It is one of the most beautiful places on earth and also one of the poorest. Life has changed little for most people here in the last hundred years. But the Shan State is the perfect place to grow opium poppies. That is how Kun Sa justifies his business to the outside world. But for the support of his people, he appeals to their patriotism. Each morning, Kun Sa's soldiers sing the Shan National Anthem, an anthem for a nation that does not exist. The Shans were promised their independence 30 years ago by the Burmese, but have never received it. For Kun Sa's soldiers, his history makes him the perfect role model. <laughs> Kun Sa was 13 when World War II ended, the same age many of his soldiers start training today. Their future is his past. He has been fighting all his life, but not always for Shan independence. Lester Wolfe chaired the House Narcotics Committee in the 1970s. He investigated Kun Sa. Uh, I was told that he was uh, one of the principal traffickers in the region. Uh, that uh, he had uh, some connection with uh, uh, their independence movement, but primarily uh, he was uh, a businessman. Uh, in other words, a uh, hired gun. A hired gun at one point for the people he was supposed to be fighting. In 1963, at the age of 30, the Burmese government made Kun Sa a militia commander in the Shan state. He was not paid. He was allowed to traffic in small amounts of opium to support his army. His future was decided. Kun Sa soon broke with the Burmese, but not the opium trade. It was far too lucrative. The farmers who grow the opium are paid very little for their labor, perhaps a few hundred dollars for their entire crop. But usually they are given salt or clothing for their opium, not cash. Kun Sa's agents buy the raw opium and then boil it carefully in makeshift jungle laboratories, the first step in turning opium into morphine or heroin. That refined opium is then loaded on horses and mules and makes its way to the border of Thailand, always under the protection of Kun Sa's army. Kun Sa charges $300,000 a ton for opium upon delivery to dealers in Thailand. 
and he delivers a lot of it. It has been said that you control as little as 30% or as much as 90% of all the opium that is grown in the, in the Shan state. What is the, the true amount? How did the man come like Bessie Bossin? 80%. Eighty percent of the Shan State's opium production is roughly 1,000 tons of opium a year. At $300,000 a ton, that's $300 million for Khun Sa. $300 million for delivering opium to Thailand, where it is refined to heroin and shipped all over the world, where its value skyrockets. On the streets of Tokyo, Paris, New York, or San Francisco, the heroin Kunsa supplies will bring more than $200 billion, and much of it comes to America. February 1989, the DEA and FBI announced the world's largest heroin bust ever, with arrests in San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles. 800 pounds of pure heroin, worth more than a billion dollars, smuggled in in tires, it came from Southeast Asia. It came from Khun Sa. Robert Bender is assistant special agent in charge of the San Francisco Office of the Drug Enforcement Administration. He spent three years as a field agent in Southeast Asia. In terms of what he supplies every year, it's a mere drop in a bucket. World's biggest heroin bust ever, and it's a drop in the bucket. To, to him. It was drug money that built this compound where Kunsa trains his soldiers. A compound that is growing every day. And it is drug money that allows Kunsa to live like what he is, the king of heroin. This is one of Kunsa's houses. He has four of them here at the compound, though we're told he seldom stays here. Sometimes he stays with villagers, sometimes with his soldiers. But Kunsa's main home is about a half mile from here at a place called the Garden. A private lake with a gazebo is the first thing you see at Khun Sa's garden. There will be two swimming pools here. Both will be lined with tile. In a country with no electricity, he has brought in a generator and power tools from Thailand to build his newest home here. It will be made of brick, also imported. He likes his food fresh, so they are raising turkey and quail here. Also geese, ducks, and rabbit. And of course, there is a fish farm. And soon, an aviary for his exotic birds. This is Khun Sa's version of paradise. Not bad for a man with a price on his head. This is a wanted poster. Under pressure from the United States, the Thai government is offering a half million baht for Khun Sa, dead or alive. That's about $20,000 in a land where a soldier's pay is 20 cents a day. Some of Khun Sa's competitors would pay much more. Which is why, wherever Khun Sa goes, even to his own army's annual soccer tournament, there are always lots of armed guards around. Even the man who serves Khun Sa's tea carries a loaded 45. If history has taught us anything, it is that anyone can be assassinated, no matter how many security guards they have, no matter how large their army. But he offers his protectors something that money can't buy. Gary? Sylvia, in the Shan state of Burma, where Khun Sa lives and works, the people live lives of utter poverty. They are oppressed brutally by the Burmese government. Khun Sa offers them hope, offers dreams of a better life, of liberty from their oppressors, of happiness. The price of hope is heroin. Khun Sa calls himself the George Washington of his people, and many of them revere him as a patriarch, to be loved and protected. The opening ceremony for the annual soccer tournament of Khun Sa's Shan United Army. A ceremony they practiced to get right before the boss arrived, General Khun Sa. These are the same men who will protect Khun Sa's opium shipments, but that was not the subject of his opening speech. The general tells them of a village in the northern Shan state that he's just learned was attacked and burned to the ground by the army of the Burmese Communist Party, his competitors in the opium trade, though that is not mentioned.
าสาโอนสีแดงปานินปานเจ้าในวาฮัตตอนซอนนัม The perfect fatherly tone coming from the world's biggest drug dealer, but that is not how his people see him. Do you wish to be like him? Yes, I wish. I came here to be a soldier, to be a Shan freedom fighter. Until six months ago, Sai Pan Mong was a student at Rangoon University. One of the students demonstrating in the streets last summer, calling for a new and democratic government in Burma. One of the students fired upon by the Burmese army. He showed us the identity card all non-Burmese must carry in Burma. It identifies him as a Shan, which means he can never get a good job or get a passport. He thinks Khun Sa will change all that for the Shan people. Because he left Shan people to fight for the Shan people, what they need, what they want, and their freedoms. Have you read that others have accused him of being a, a, a drug dealer? I have heard, but I have no seen by my eyes. Nor will he. Not here at Khun Sa's compound. Not here in Khun Sa's valley. What he will see is the school that Khun Sa's drug money has built. A school for the villagers' children, where they learn a discipline and respect that would be the envy of any American teacher. And he will see the hospital Khun Sa's drug money pays for, where the young boys in Khun Sa's boys' brigade line up each morning to get pills for a stomach ache or antibiotics for the flu, where a village man can get an injection for an intestinal problem, and all of it free of charge, and where Dr. Bury, also a refugee from the capital of Burma. Treats Khun Sa's soldiers wounded in battle. This one uh, wounded by bullet, and the femoral is broken. As a doctor, how do you feel about the fact that everything here is financed through the opium trade? <clears throat> you know, I did an interest in the opium trade. Uh, It's not my job, so, so I didn't interest on it. <laughs> the doctor, like the soldier, suffers from a common syndrome here: see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. They think only of the fight for freedom from Burma. They see only the good Khun Sa's drug money does for the Shan people, and some of them owe their lives to Khun Sa, like Rong Kiao, a refugee from an area controlled by the Burmese government. Uh, unlike uh, it, but, uh, no. เขาเอาทิ้งไว้ค่ะนะเอ่อเพราะว่านาซิกเนี่ยเขากูกุนลักไปเนี่ยเขามัดต้อยกันเข้าบางปอก็อันเมื่อหัดบัวตานั่นเ
He has been called the Prince of Darkness, and by the devil, we are being offered a deal. Kun Sa has made millions of dollars from the heroin trade, and now he desperately wants to become legitimate. He wants to be recognized by the United States, by any Western power, as the savior of his people, not the world's most wanted criminal. So Kun Sa is offering to quit the drug business, to eradicate half the world's heroin supply, for a price. It is Thursday morning, April 6th. Kun Sa arrives on time for our 9 o'clock interview. You have a very beautiful compound. His security force arrived about 15 minutes earlier. Even though this is his compound, the base camp of his 10,000-man army, Kun Sa doesn't take any chances. <laughs> Seated beneath pictures of the king and queen of Thailand, a country that has placed a price on his head, Kun Sa, the opium king with the haunting laugh, told us of his plan to get his people out of the opium and heroin business forever. This is Kun Sa's six-year plan for ending opium production in the Shan State. It calls for bringing in agricultural specialists to help his farmers grow other crops and medical specialists to teach them the evil their opium brings to the world building roads and bridges to get their new crops to market, schools to educate their children, and hospitals to provide medical care. In exchange, Kun Sa will deliver an increasing percentage of his opium to authorities and decrease the amount that has grown until it's all gone at the end of six years. The price tag to the United States government is $288 million to be paid over six years. And Kun Sa will allow American observers to come in and, and, and check the opium production and, and, and be involved in every step of the eradication program? An absurd statement coming from the world's biggest heroin supplier, but he's been making the offer for at least 12 years. But in 1977, the House Select Committee on Narcotics did recommend making a deal with Kun Sa in this report, a deal called a preemptive buy. The reason the committee cited is this. What we have done in the past has not been effective. The report goes on to conclude the answer is not helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft to transport troops. We have to reach some sort of agreement with the people who are growing opium. Lester Wolf chaired the House Narcotics Committee in 1977. Their recommendation was rejected by the Carter White House. We were told that uh, this was against policy, and yet prior to that time in 1972, the United States government paid a million dollars uh, to some group uh, for 26 tons of opium. We also, uh, subsequent to that, uh, paid the Turkish government not to plant opium. Uh, this was, in, in effect, a preemptive buy as well. Instead, Washington opted for more helicopters and more troops. This is videotape taken by the Thai military of its assault on Kun Sa's compound in northern Thailand in January 1982. It had been his base of operations unmolested for five years until pressure from the U.S. became too great. Weapons and supplies were seized in this raid, but not Kun Sa. A week before, he had moved across the border into Burma, where he travels his land with his security force, where his new compound is ten times as large, and the so-called war against him and his army is even less effective. 
The countries that are supposed to be fighting Kunsa run articles like this one in the Bangkok Post on Friday, April 7th. It says the Border Patrol police and Kunsa's men are poised to do battle. But on that date, Kunsa's frontline forces were busy smoking venison from a deer they killed and erecting a new headquarters building, not preparing for battle. The simple fact is, Kunsa has built a kingdom for himself and his drug money makes him untouchable. As distasteful as it is, Kun Sa's offer may be the only hope for stopping the flow of his heroin. While Western governments continue to reject it, Kun Sa keeps on laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> We asked drug czar William Bennett to respond to Kunsa's offer. He said that he is just beginning to study Asian narcotics matters, that he has until September 5th to formulate his national drug strategy, that for now, he has no comment. Bob, Sylvia? This could be a screenplay. Yeah, <laughs> many.